Welcome everyone to the fifth of our guest speakers in the DRA 2021 get guest speaker series. My name is Lee Darzell and I'm the National Member Experience Manager for Disaster Relief Australia. Tonight we have the great pleasure of being joined by David Smith who is keen to share his story with you all. As a way of introduction, David Smith was born in Adelaide, South Australia and graduated into the Royal Australian Infantry Corps in December 1991. During his 35 year military career, Dave served in a wide range of roles, both in Australia and overseas. He has commanded at every level from platoon around 30 soldiers to brigade around 300 soldiers, 3000 soldiers, and has seen operational service in East Timor three times, Solomon Islands and Afghanistan. Dave was appointed as a member of the Board of Disaster Relief Australia in August 2021. We are all keen to hear David's story tonight, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming David this evening. Over to you, David. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Lee. Right, well, uh, yeah, thanks very much, Lee. And look, um, to everyone who's, uh, who's online who may hear this subsequently, um, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, before I begin, I would though like to just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, on which we meet today, wherever that may be, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have served in the defence of Australia in peace and war. Lee has asked me uh, to take some time this evening to talk to you about my career journey, what I've achieved, how I've achieved it, how I've overcome any adversity encountered along the way and what lessons I've taken from my experience to date. That's a, uh, that's a lot of information to cover. I promise to do my best to avoid prattling on too much uh, and boring you with detail as I try and do that though and keep it as succinct as I can. The first thing I would like to say is that I really don't consider myself to be remarkable in any way, shape or form. Um, any success that I have achieved during the last 34 years or so of my service in the Australian Army has really become come as a direct result of the very fortunate upbringing that I enjoy, the work of the many exceptional leaders for whom I've worked and the mentors from whom I've learned, the highly supportive, collegiate and often very patient and tolerant peers with whom I've served and the countless committed and professional subordinates that I've been privileged to lead. I suppose a good place for me to start would be to explain how I ended up in the Army in the first place. As Lee said, I was born in Adelaide and I left school at the end of 1987, bound for Adelaide University with the aim of studying economics as a precursor to entering the law program. At the same time, or around the same time, I enlisted in the Army Reserve with the aim of becoming an officer. And there were three main reasons that led me to go down this path. The first is that my family actually has a very strong military background. My grandfather served in World War I, Two of my uncles served in World War II and another uncle, uh, both in the army, I should say, my grandfather and, and two of my uncles. And I had another uncle who served in the Air Force during World War II and then subsequently in the regular army as a soldier until the end of the Vietnam War. My brother had also graduated from the Royal Military College six months after the end of my year 12. So in combination, these things meant that joining the army almost seemed like a natural sort of thing to do. The second thing was that the Army Reserve commitment was really only part time, which meant that I could easily fit it in amongst everything else that I wanted to do. And I could always walk away from it relatively easily if it wasn't what I hoped it would be. And finally, and perhaps most importantly for my 17 year old self at that stage, I developed a pretty healthy ego at school, as well as a taste for being in charge. So to an outsider, as I was at that point, Becoming an officer in the Army seemed very attractive and very logical. And my start at university was less than ideal. My first lecture covered off on almost the entire year 12 economic syllabus, in which I'd been reasonably successful within the 30, first 30 minutes. And after this, the lecturer then quickly moved on to a consideration of statistics, an understanding of which was, was essential, but which were as a mathematically challenged humanities enthusiast well beyond me. After pushing through for about two months, I, I came to the conclusion that economics really wasn't for me. 
and I took the rest of the year off to work as a gardener uh, full time at a nursing home, which was one of a number run by a organisation called Elder Care Incorporated, of which my father was then the chief executive. I returned to university the following year, having enrolled in a Bachelor of Arts majoring in English, with the hope that by playing to my strongest suit of humanities, I would understand enough of the curriculum and enjoy university sufficiently to get the marks necessary to be admitted to the law program. However, by mid-1989, I was halfway into my officer training in the Army Reserve and finding that I was thoroughly enjoying Army life and that I was actually probably naturally suited to it. On top of that, during the early part of 1989, I'd struck up, struck up a close friendship with my now wife, Selena, which by mid-year had become much more serious. Selena, who was also a member of the Army Reserve, was quick to see my potential as a regular Army officer, and her encouragement, together with the success and enjoyment that I was experiencing with my reserve service, saw me quit university at the end of the first semester in 1989, and eventually applied to enlist in the regular army as an officer in mid-1990, six months after I'd graduated from my Army Reserve officer training. I spent the 18 months or so between leaving university and entering the army, working full-time as an assistant nurse at the same nursing home at which I was previously a gardener, eventually working almost exclusively with dementia patients. Although I admit that this was about as far from most people's idea of service in the army as you could get, the experience, particularly at the age that I was at, taught me an enormous amount about hard work, humility, compassion, and the need to listen to and respect other people. Because of my status as an Army Reserve Officer, I was asked, following my success at the Army Officer Selection Board, if I'd be interested in attending the Officer Cadet School of New Zealand rather than the Royal Military College. At the time that I was asked this question, it appeared a very attractive option. The course was only 12 months long, as opposed to 18 months at Duntroon, and it meant that I would get a trip to New Zealand as part of the bargain. The reality, though, was a little different. The training at the Officer Cadet School in New Zealand was very intense. The New Zealand Army is heavily influenced by the experience of the second New Zealand Expeditionary Force in World War II, which suffered through the withdrawal from Greece and on Crete, during which it was almost continuously in contact with a German force that held absolute superiority in the air and on the ground. The training philosophy at OCS was therefore based on the principle that even when the men are dead on their feet, the officers can never stop. Training in the military ethic was a major feature of the course as well. The commandant of the school lecture, lectured us regularly on aspects such as the habitual pursuit of excellence, honesty, integrity, moral and physical courage and loyalty. The physical and field training were also tough, made all the more so by the unforgiving terrain in the Wairu training area and the long and very cold winters, which would see regular snowfalls, usually apparently deliberately timed to coincide with field training exercises. The nature of Wairu is perhaps best summed up in a 1950s quote at the start of the opening chapter of one of the New Zealand Army training manuals, which simply said, Wairu is where we send men to make them tough. The small size of each class also meant that there was nowhere to hide. This differed in many respects from life at Duntroon, where there were generally up to five times as many cadets in each class, making it impossible to rotate everyone through assessed command appointments. This was certainly not the case at OCS, where you could expect to rotate multiple times through multiple commander leadership appointments, during which your every move and word were observed, written down and subsequently analysed. And to top it all off, you only got about one and a half to two days off every six weeks or so, so there was little opportunity to get out and see New Zealand as I'd hoped. Despite the challenges of OCS, my sanity survived intact and I returned home soon after my graduation as a Lieutenant into the Royal Australian Infantry Corps in December 1992. Selena and I were married about four weeks later and then headed to Townsville and the start of a very different life than that which I'd anticipated when I first left school. Since then, my career has seen us posted to Townsville four times, Canberra four times, 
New Zealand for a second time, but this time with a boot on the other foot as the Australian Exchange instructor, Officer Instructor at the Officer Cadet School, Ballarat, Sydney and Melbourne. As a family, we've lived in 18 houses. Our son Campbell, who was born in 1993, attended seven different schools and our daughter Laura, who was born in 1995, five schools. Selena has held countless different jobs, completed a range of different university and TAFE courses, co-owned an art studio and been awarded the National Vocational Student of the Year Award amongst, any other amongst many other highlights along the way. In addition, like so many other military families, we've never lived close to grandparents or other family members. So our army, fam army family has always been our support network. My career has also given me the very great privilege and enormous responsibility of commanding Australian Defence Force personnel at every level from platoon to formation, both on operations and at home. I've also had the opportunity to serve alongside soldiers from a variety of other nations, including the United States, Great Britain, New Zealand, Singapore, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea and Slovakia. Beyond this, I've been given the great privilege of undertaking far reaching work on the future of the Army and worked along enormously gifted public service staff from the Departments of Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Prime Minister and Cabinet, as well as the Australian Federal Police. Finally, during the last five years, I've been enormously privileged to lead work to supply and sustain the personal equipment that enables Australian Defence Force warfighters to complete their mission and return home safely. As someone who's spent the vast majority of his career at the practitioner end of the business, I really couldn't think of many better ways to see out my service in the regular army, which will come to an end early next year, than being involved with this essential work. As the end of my regular army career rapidly approaches, I, perhaps, I have perhaps unsurprisingly been spending quite a bit of time reflecting on my service. Although I've learnt and in some cases forgotten a great many lessons during the last 34 years, I would have to say that there are two things that I consider unique about military service and I'm sure that a number of those who are online tonight will appreciate these. The first is the expectation right from day one that you will exercise leadership on a daily basis both on and off duty. This is a responsibility that I take very seriously. Second, my service has given me the chance to lead and work alongside some of the best people that this nation has to offer, all the while learning far more from them about humility, leadership, selflessness and self-sacrifice than I could ever have hoped. In fact, if you ask me what it has been that's kept me in the Army all these years, despite some very challenging times, it has been the quality of the people that I have served with. There is truly something unique and special about going to work every day alongside people who almost to a person can be relied upon to tell you the truth, do what they say they will do and do their work to the absolute best of their ability at all times, not because of any hope of personal reward, but simply because that is what service to the nation means. During my time in the Army, the other thing that I've really learned a lot about is leadership. Some of these things I've learned by doing and often failing and others more often from watching and working directly for some of the finest leaders in the nation. These have included people such as the former Governor General uh, Sir Peter Cosgrove, the former Queensland Flood Task Force Commander and Forces Commander Australia and now DRA Director Major General Mick Slater, the current Chief of uh, Joint Operations Lieutenant General Greg Bilton, the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, Vice Admiral David Johnston, and someone that very few people will know, uh, but I respect greatly, the former Assistant Secretary of the National Security Branch of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr Steve McFarlane. I've also had a great uh, privilege of studying leadership during countless training courses, as well as at university, and uh, this time round, or those times round, with much greater success than I achieved previously. My experiences and training have also taught me many other things, especially how to maintain focus in adversity and the need for relentless positivity and the belief that you will succeed no matter the obstacles you are facing. 
However, probably the most important lessons I've learned are about the practice of leadership, which I think can really be distilled into five key takeaways for me personally. Firstly, I believe that the role of a leader is to operate on the margins of uncertainty, creating certainty that managers can subsequently oversee. This means that leaders at every level must be comfortable with being uncomfortable, commit themselves to searching relentlessly for the heart of the matter at hand and the factors impacting it and always remain open-minded and inquisitive. Second, in order to create certainty, especially in more senior roles, leaders must have an unambiguous vision or aim that they can clearly articulate and that others can identify with. Once they've established their vision, everything else they do must be ruthlessly subordinated to it if they are to bring their team along willingly for the ride. With the exception of culture, I consider the quality and focus of this vision more than anything else that will drive an organisation's success or failure. Third, I consider that leadership is a verb, not a noun. While that may not necessarily be 100% grammatically correct, for me, it simply means that you cannot be a successful leader by merely studying the theory of leadership and the principles underpinning it, or by simply occupying designated leadership appointments. Leadership success requires you to act as a leader and seek to influence others, all the while learning from your mistakes and seeking to study your own and other leadership styles in order to improve. Fourth, leadership is actually about the people you purport to lead, not yourself and or recognition of your achievements, none of which will be possible without them anyway. Although there are innumerable de definitions of leadership, the majority have at their heart a focus on influencing others to achieve goals. You therefore simply cannot lead successfully unless you make your team and their success the focus of your efforts. And to this end, I'm a great believer in Robert Green Greenleaf's principle of servant leadership, which for those who are not familiar with it, emphasises the role of the leader as a coach and mentor and focuses on skills such as listening, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, conceptualisation, foresight, stewardship, commitment to the growth of people and building community. And to this, I would add a ready willingness to empower staff by giving them clear direction on what needs to be done, but not how to do it, and then fight for the time, space and resources they need to deliver. I think you also need to be kind rather than judgmental and critical. Very few people start their day or are given tasks with intent to make mistakes or deliver poor results. I think it's beholden on leaders, therefore, to take a glass half full view when their team makes mistakes by taking the hits on their behalf, being patient, trying to put themselves in other shoes and helping the team to learn from the experience. Finally, and most importantly for me, I consider the foundation of success as a leader to be character. This includes having the moral courage to do the right thing as opposed to doing things right, admitting mistakes and the willingness to take the advice of others. It, includes, it also includes sound personal behaviour, honesty and integrity, a refusal to ask others to do what you are not prepared to do yourself, reliability and humility. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, it means accepting that you do not have the gift of infinite wisdom. Now, the development and enhancement of character is not easy, as I'm sure many will appreciate. It requires the constant exercise of self-leadership through self-discipline, the seeking out of additional responsibility, and a focus on influencing others positively via personal example and attitude. It also requires you to be a good team member by always putting the organisation ahead of yourself, being loyal to the organisation's leadership, and being personally accountable for yourself and your role. And finally, it requires you to constantly take a long, hard look at yourself and be brutally honest about what you've done and how you can do better. And it's taken me many years of service and some very hard lessons myself and some very difficult circumstances to discover these lessons. In saying this and, and spelling out those things, I'm not suggesting for one minute that I've reached some type of leadership and character nirvana. I'm well short of that, even though I do constantly strive to achieve it. In the years since I've left school though, what I've come to realise is that there's very little about what I have learned in my service that I actually probably didn't really already know, 
before I commenced it. Indeed, I, I consider that the seeds of success as a leader on my military career were sown both at home and during my five years of secondary schooling. The Army has simply helped me to discover and refine my character and has given me the skills and opportunity to become the type of leader that I believe I am. I would like to think that this character has been revealed during each of the five deployments that I've completed, especially in Afghanistan and during the numerous demanding and commanded staff appointments that I've held in my career. There is, of course, very little new in what I've said this evening about leadership and character, except maybe as it relates to my own personal experience. Indeed, I'd like to think that much of what I've said would resonate with the many outstanding military leaders that this nation has produced. This is because while times may change, I don't consider that the fundamentals of leadership do. It is still an intensely personal process focused on people and helping them to be the best they can be. In closing, I'd like to thank you for the privilege of speaking to you this, to you this evening. When my good friend Mick Slater first approached me earlier this year about the possibility of my joining the Board of Disaster Relief Australia, I didn't hesitate for two reasons. First, simply because Mick asked me. But second, and perhaps more compellingly, because I saw in DRA the chance to continue to serve aside as alongside other like-minded people with many similar experiences to mine. To mine. I only hope that I'm worthy of the opportunity. I'd now be more than happy to take any questions that you might have for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, David. Um, that was that was a very inspirational uh, talk and a journey of your of your um, life, which has been fantastic and very full. <laughs> um, you've done a lot in a in a short space of time as well, over a period of time. Um, so we do have a couple of questions um, that from our members directly. So the first question is from Jane, um, who basically says, "What motivated you to join our board?" Yeah, so um, uh, thanks, Jane. As, as I uh, as I said at the end there, um, the, fir the first reason I, I um, was motivated to join the board is that uh, Mick Slater, who, who I mentioned when I was speaking, um, I, I've had the great privilege um, of serving under Mick's command on, on at least three occasions in my career. Um, but um, in that process, we've become very good friends. And when I was visiting, uh, my wife and I were visiting Mick and his wife Danielle in Sydney earlier this year, um, Mick asked me about whether I would be interested in joining the board of DRA. Uh, and um, the, for, from my perspective, um, the fact that it was re that, that Mick recommended it to me, that he thought it was something that I'd be interested in knowing me as he did, uh, would have been good enough. Uh, but then I then took the time to um, do some more research into what DRA was about, what it stood for and the opportunities that it presents. And in that process, I spoke to, to Jeff Evans and um, Liz Rushbrook and um, Will McNulty uh, and, and to Rodney um, and a number of other people. And, and the thing that struck me most about it was that there's an opportunity to continue to serve. People are, are there because they want to continue to serve the community and because it provides an opportunity, particularly for veterans, to continue that service. And uh, having spent the last 34 years of my life serving, coming to the end of my career, it made sense for me to want to continue to serve as part of an organisation that is so closely connected to the veteran community. Thanks, Dave. That was a very uh, full answer there and um, it explains basically yeah, your your background and why you got involved in DRA. Um, there's another question from Waz, um, which kind of asked the same thing, but the, the final part of his question is, what is your vision? Um, what is the vision you have for the future for DRA? So uh, thanks, Waz. And look, I I, um, I suppose in part I could I could sort of take the easy way out and just say, well, you know, I don't necessarily own that vision. That's that's a vision for the board and the senior leadership of DRA. Um, I I think that um, it is it is about really about continuing to provide opportunities for people to serve. And the, the, the more we can expand our footprint to enable that service, to provide opportunities for people uh, to continue, not, not because people want to hand out 
um, but because they want to have that opportunity and the skills that they can bring. There's a lot of discussion in the community at the moment about people understanding the, the, the very unique skills and mindset and attitude that people who have served, and, and I'm not just restricting my comments here to people who have served in the Australian Defence Force, it's, it's people who have served in emergency services and the like, that they can bring to any organisation. And, uh, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time now as a, as a serving, still serving member of the Defence Force, talking about the importance of the engagement that we do with community to, um, to reinforce the fact that as a Defence Force, we are drawn from the community and we serve the community. And we've seen a lot of that through uh, the support that's been provided to Bushfire Assist um, in the immediate response operations there and the support that the ADF has provided to, uh, to COVID. But I think equally through providing opportunities for, for those who have served to continue to serve through DRA, it continues to reinforce that relationship with community and uh, provides a really important function to continuing to allow those veterans out there um, to continue to feel as though they can connect with their community, that they can bring the skills that they've learned um, to helping other Australians. And uh, so I think the ability to expand our footprint to continue to do that uh, and to continue to work with or develop our ability to work with other organisations, like-minded organisations in helping to deliver that outcome is really important for the future of DRA. Brilliant, thanks, David. Um, so there's another question from Mary. So she asked, where, where are you actually based now and would you like to get on an operation? <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll answer that I'll, in, in true sort of military senior officer style, I'll answer the first question, um, the last question first. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so not really um, that practical for me at the moment, still sort of working full time. So I'm based in Melbourne at Victoria Barracks, um, uh, but um, have um, pretty extensive responsibilities in my current role as a director general there. But um, I will finish up. In, in my current role on the 14th of December and then go on a period of leave. And one of the things that I'm really committed to doing is getting out on the ground. Um, you know, as an infantry officer by trade, most of my career has been spent actually out on the ground um, doing the job. Uh, and it's only been in the last sort of 10 years or so, I suppose, that I've moved back into sort of more desk bound work. So I'm really keen to get out on the ground as soon as I possibly can to see the work that's done firsthand I'm a great believer in the idea that, um, you know, that, that leaders that, that sit at the, at the head of organisations need to get out. They need to get out and speak to people who are actually delivering the effect, the outcome, um, understanding what their needs are and seeing how their work is being done and understanding what some obstacles might be so that they can perform their function, which, as I said when I spoke in big part, is about getting rid of those obstacles as best they can. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Um, that basically concludes all of our questions for tonight. Um, on behalf of DRA, we, we want to thank you for your time um, this evening and speaking to us. And as a little um, kind of gift of, our, of your time, um, we will, as you know, we've got a DRA shop now, which we've got some um, brilliant merchandise in there. So we'll uh, send you a little voucher so you can buy yourself something nice. <laughs> I, look really, I, I hope that that uh, I've sort of met some expectations this evening that uh, that uh, I, there was something in value uh, a value in, in what I had to say but I really again I really appreciate the opportunity so early in my time as a director to be able to, to have this opportunity to speak to people brilliant and thank you like thank you again for your, for your time and um, all our members appreciate that and it's nice to actually see um, our board members as well so you're kind of real people with real a vision and real thoughts so um thank you again for your time and hopefully we'll see you um around um adelaide maybe because that, because that's where we're based um but in the in the future on an operation it'll be great to see you see you there yeah. as well yeah <laughs> Cool. All right. Well, thank you, David. Um, and I'll sign off for tonight. And thank you, everyone who's uh, on the call listening tonight. Um, and this will be put on our website so everyone can view it again at a later date. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you.